In this lecture, I'll be introducing the environment, environmental issues as a whole, as an introduction also to biodiversity uh, issues of climate change that we'll be discussing uh, uh, in the next section here. Uh, so overall, this section, we're going to look at a number of different things. Uh, we're going to look at what exactly is meant by environmental from a lay perspective, as well as uh, from an uh, an environmental anthropology perspective. We'll look at the conflicting notions of conservation and preservation in the United States, both historically, uh, but we might also consider uh, how some vestiges of this are still around today. We'll consider the science of ecology. Uh, this will be discussed in uh, further uh, detail uh, in the film All Watched Over by Machines of Love and Grace, The Use and Abuse of Vegetational Concepts. Um, We'll look at the rise of the environmental movement, particularly in the United States and then globally, looking at environmental law and policy um, over the last several decades. And I'll point out a couple case studies, one by Bilal Butt, um, who uh, did his work uh, on the safari um, in uh, Kenya, and uh, some of my work in uh, looking at Tox Island Dam and what has become the Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area. So to start off, we might ask ourselves what it is that we mean by environmental. Um, and depending on your definition of the environment uh, and how you conceptualize our place in the environment, are humans in fact a part of the environment? Are we a part and parcel of the environment? Or are we apart from the environment? That is something that is distinct about human beings that makes us separate from the environment. Um, and then how do we realize uh, aesthetically pleasing environments uh, versus uh, environments which might not be as aesthetically pleasing. And I mentioned this uh, when we were talking about food security issues when I was talking about um, um, the work um, uh, on uh, fresh fruit broken bodies and in that piece how uh, migrant farm workers looked at the beautiful Skagit Valley and they saw something very different from uh, the lush mountains and the, and, and the uh, wildlife and the beautiful sun um, and clouds and whatnot, very green, very verdant environment, but they didn't see the same sense of aesthetics that a tourist might see um, in the particular setting. So in the United States, there's uh, what has framed a lot of the discussions around um, environmental issues has been the issue of resource utilization. And there are two main figures uh, historically that have informed a lot of uh, policy in a lot of the different directions that both the formal uh, environmental uh, organizations within the government have taken as well as non-government organizations and of course environmental organizations exist along a, a complete spectrum of different approaches to the environment themselves. Uh, we have Gifford Pinchot who uh, follows the idea of the multiple use sustained yield uh, concept. His vision was very utilitarian in terms of dealing with nature, that nature was something that was fundamentally for human beings. And it had to be utilized, but it had to be utilized in a wise manner, uh, that we could make intelligent decisions about managing resources for the benefit not only of mankind, all of mankind or humankind today, um, but also going forward into future generations. And a lot of this was Pinchot's background uh, in the Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area in Milford, Pennsylvania, where he saw a lot of the deforestation that was taking place around him. Indeed, his uh, f father and grandfather had been involved in a lot of the logging that was uh, bringing logs down the Delaware um, and then out floated essentially down the Delaware and he was seeing the denuding of uh, landscapes um, and if you go up and you drive through Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area today it might be easy to imagine this place was always very green but um, indeed in, during Pinchot's time if you go up to Milford Knob and you go to the what is today the Pinchot Mansion as part of the US Forest Service uh, the landscape was essentially denuded you could see um, clear vistas without uh, very much in the way in terms of trees or anything like that. So Pinchot is the first professional forester um, in the United States. He's associated with uh, Yale. Um, he was trained in Europe um, 
and uh, becomes the first professional forester in the United States and becomes head of the Forest Service. Uh, both uh, he and John Muir competed for the ear of Roosevelt uh, and there were some heated exchanges about how nature uh, should be thought about. Uh, John Muir was a preservationist. Um, he is probably most well associated with the Sierras in California. Um, he looked at uh, the earth uh, preservation of the environment for the sake of the earth as a whole. Um, and the uh, model of doing this was uh, an exclusionary model where uh, humans wouldn't necessarily uh, trans, uh, transgress, or if they did transgress, it would be much in the same lines of um, visits to wilderness areas, uh, visits to natural areas that would connect us up uh, to the environment um, as we were potentially fundamentally apart from it and only through connection with the environment, communing with the environment, will be, would we become a part of the environment. From the film, we saw uh, a number of theorists talk about ecology. Um, Arthur Tansley is noted for coining the term ecosystem. Um, and during this time period in ecology, there was this notion of climax communities. That is, that uh, nature was essentially working in lockstep fashion, and much like the unilineal evolutionists believed, uh, the ecologists at the time believed that the environment itself, uh, depending on the particular biome, uh, the, the, the terrestrial ecosystem, was going towards some sort of climax or ultimate stage. Um, and and um, so there was this notion of stability that would come in, this notion of homeostasis, and that ultimately the, um, things would balance out. Um, and Jay Forrester picks up on these ideas with cybernetics. Uh, and essentially nature, uh, under this idea, um, everything operates as a system. It's regulated by feedback loops. So nature is self-correcting. And these are some of the narratives potentially in contemporary environmental thought that uh, we as human beings cannot possibly do anything uh, to the earth because nature heals itself. In fact, uh, I was out at the Drake oil well a couple summers back and I was talking to one of the individuals out there um, and they were very much of the idea and opinion that um, things like Oil Creek uh, that was essentially uh, an environmental uh, dead zone at the height of extraction had come back and was indeed a great fishing creek uh, nowadays, uh, one of the best in Pennsylvania as a whole, and he had talked about this idea of nature healing itself. Uh, the Odom brothers, Eugene and Howard, were known for their work in systems analysis, and they intentionally uh, used circuit boards as an analogy uh, for uh, explaining what was happening in the ecosystem. And so um, you had the idea of energy flow through the ecosystem and how it was conducted and how it moved through the ecosystem as a whole. Um, and they had a number of feedback loops within this that showed um, essentially along the lines of electrical flow as a whole. Garrett Hardin is uh, well known for his work on the tragedy of the commons. And this makes the, um, well, he situates it in the context of paddocks in um, the UK. And uh, essentially, the argument goes is that you have, uh, as individuals, you have so many head of cattle and you have a common pool resource, which is essentially all of the foraging area. Uh, and as an individual, it makes sense to maximize your utility by sending as many cattle um, onto the common area, the common pool resource, and essentially denuding the landscape. You would, uh, if everyone seeks to maximize their number of head of cattle, they are ultimately going to um, overextend the ability of the ecosystem to regenerate effectively and to maintain uh, the number of, of uh, cattle uh, animal units per given area. Uh, now one of the things that this excludes is any sort of mechanisms uh, within culture, any sort of regulation within culture to control the extraction of resources overall. And I'll talk a little bit about this uh, in a little bit. This uh, ranges all the way from foraging societies um, all the way up to uh, industrial agriculture uh, where you have uh, farmers, for example, in Shorman and Haynes' piece along uh, the Mississippi Delta, 
deliberately regulating themselves to prevent the uh, incursion of government agents in the work uh, that they're doing to grow food overall. So we see many mechanisms that are in place uh, either uh, that do not exist in an institutional setting, uh, whether this is in small scale uh, forging societies all the way up to industrial agriculture. Um, so there are very deliberate decisions that are made by individuals that have a vested interest in maintaining the resource over long periods of time versus this notion of common pool resources. Uh, if we think about um, the notion of, of the environment as a whole, uh, Wolfgang Sachs has come up with this notion of three different perspectives which are good for framing uh, the debates and discussions over the last 30 or 40 years uh, concerning the environment as a whole. And uh, these are uh, fundamentally different perspectives on looking at the earth as a whole. Um, the first uh, one is what's been termed, according to Socks, as the contest perspective. And this essentially boils down to cost-benefit logic. Uh, essentially, you have utilitarian argue, arguments which are espoused here. Nature becomes a resource that is to be utilized. Um, there is notion of um, development as something that lasts versus growth. And that the ultimate driver here, what ends up happening, is that the North should invest in the South for the long-term sustainability of the environment, the global ecosystem as a whole. So this is uh, indeed uh, a global management regimes where you have a bifurcation or a splitting into two of North and South, of resource flows from uh, investment from the North uh, into the South. Although historically, of course, you do have uh, but through colonialism and neocolonialism, the extraction of resources from so-called South countries or developing, uh, the developing uh, world, least developed world, less developed world, underdeveloped world, to the uh, so-called higher developed, more developed, or sometimes even overdeveloped nations uh, of the North as a whole. The second perspective is the, uh, the astronaut's perspective. And this is uh, the perspective um, that many uh, people started to uh, gravitate towards uh, once uh, a lot of the pictures started coming back from uh, the moon, the earth rise, and the realization of the relative isolation of uh, planet earth uh, in the vastness and empty, relative emptiness of space as a whole. Uh, and so there were discussions here about things like lifeboat ethics. This was, uh, again, the time when a lot of lot was made about uh, population issues and overpopulation. Um, the spaceship Earth idea focuses, again, on lifeboat ethics, on triage, potentially. Research uh, is uh, big here. A big science is coming into play in order to solve um, global issues, things like climate modeling, uh, and then the potential suggestions for required policy shifts that would go along with um, climate change uh, overall. Uh, here in this perspective, the North essentially has the responsibility for all of the Earth. So that the North is essentially the manager uh, of the planet as a whole through the utilization of science and policy to control the comings and goings of the global South. Uh, overall, since they're in this paradigm, there's the notion of scarcity, uh, the notion of um, economic development is somewhat tenuous given the relatively scarce resources that need to be distributed. Finally, the home perspective um, calls into mind uh, the local, uh, the focus on local livelihoods. Uh, and here you have the notion of the main maintenance of cultural traditions the allowing of the passing of knowledge from one generation to the other through traditional ecological knowledge, through embodied knowledge, and through place-based knowledge. Uh, in this perspective, as Sox argues, this considers the crisis of justice and equity in a way that the astronaut's perspective and the contest perspective do not. Uh, and here you have this notion of resistance against development, and particularly development that takes the form of top-down doctrines that are essentially dictated from the North to the South, either in terms of 
of economic development, where the North invests in the South, or global science, where the North essentially